right, welcome back to our special Politics by Faith, The Collapse of the Nuclear Family. I want to go to Pastor Alan Jackson. He's the pastor of World Outreach Church and host of the show, Alan Jackson Now. Pastor, how are you, sir? Great, Mike. It's good to be with you again. I'm glad you're here, and thanks for, for bringing in this, this spiritual perspective to this incredibly important topic. What are the spiritual forces working against marriage in our world today? Wow. Well, I think your question has the essence of it. I think first we have to acknowledge there are spiritual forces that work against us. You know, I believe there is a God who created the heaven and the earth, including human beings, and he's given us a template for the best way to be. And then I think there are spiritual forces that work against that. And if we can make those concessions, they're like the, the givens in a geometric proof, then we can start to talk about how we overcome that opposition. But I, I think obviously the, the strength of culture, of society, is that nuclear family. I don't believe there's any better way for children to, to grow up, ideally, than with their birth parents. Now, I, we live in a broken world, and that's often not op, uh, the opportunity, and we have to overcome that. But I don't think we should redefine what the objective would be just to fit the awkwardness of our reality. Yes. Uh, there's so many different places to... There's so many people in these broken situations. So I'm trying to figure out where best to start off with the situation. Let's start off maybe with a married couple. No, no, let's do a couple that has been divorced. How do you, as a pastor, speak to a divorced, divorced adults? Well, I mean, obviously I'm a pastor, so I've spent my professional life in the church world. And I think it's helpful for me to start with the acknowledgement that the church is not a hall of fame. We don't gather for our services to preen about because we are flawless. The church is a triage unit. We're much more a hospital where we come in our brokenness with the, to acknowledge that we need the redemptive power of God to help restore our lives to, in order to, to get to a better place. I mean, I'm a poster child for that. I went through a divorce when I was 23. And, you know, at that time, it was some years ago, you know, in, to be a professional Christian and face that really would put you beyond the pale. And I lost most of my professional associations. And, and, but what it did for me was recognize the need for restoration. And I didn't have much compassion around me because I hadn't been a very compassionate person. You know, I used to say, if you did good things, good things would happen. And if you did bad things, bad things would happen. And life was simple. I was young and stupid. And when my life blew apart, there wasn't a great deal of compassion. So I said I would spend the rest of my life doing my best to help broken people find restoration and redemption. But that doesn't mean we don't have boundaries. It doesn't mean we've eliminated sin. You know, we live in a broken world, and but we serve a God who is restores and redeems. I think that's the heart of the message of the gospel. Unfortunately, I think the church has kind of perverted that, and we've kind of dumbed down sin. We're down to two commandments it seems, and I think that's not helpful. But you know, if I could talk to a couple who've been divorced or been through any sort of that kind of brokenness in their family or children that have survived a divorce, there's some things that are a result of that, a tremendous sense of rejection, whether you've processed it consciously or not, it's the reality, whether you're the offended party or the offender, whether you're a child in the midst of that, there's a tremendous sense of rejection. And I think we need some freedom and some healing from that in order to be able to form healthier, more normal relationships as we go forward in our lives. So it's a complex issue, but there's hope because there's a God and he will help us. That part's true. What, if you could talk to the 22 year old Alan Jackson, what would you have said to him on this topic? Wow. Well, I think first of all, I would have given him a little counsel on smugness and arrogance and because there was probably way too much of that. Life seemed so clear and I was so certain. There's a lot of that I think that comes with that season of life. And, and then I would have probably encouraged him with a little bit of patience. Um, you know, the world was like, that was back in the early eighties. And I mean, the, a lot of the, the voices were different, but you know, I, I think understanding the, the, the best piece of advice I was ever given about marriage in general was you want to marry somebody whose character you would trust your future with. Almost everything else about that relationship will change and grow and emerge, but you want to select a life partner whose character is so intact that you would trust your future in their hands. And I wish I had understood that better when I was 22. 
there needs to, I've, I've said this for a while now, there needs, there needs to be a massive cultural change and advice we give to young people on choosing your husband or wife. Uh, I don't know how people are choosing it now, but it's not good. <laughs> like we, need, we need to reassess what we're doing because it ain't working. Yeah, uh, I think we could revisit that. That'd be another show. Yeah, that's right. I don't know if it's based off of feels and, and we just need to think more as, as you just articulated there. Let's talk to kids uh, and, and people watching now who went through a divorce when they were kids, their parents got divorced and they're now adults and maybe have not, almost certainly have not processed this fully. Um, what is your advice to, to people who are the products of a, of a broken marriage? Well, I think the first thing I would say is it's not your fault. You know, because we all tend to internalize that. And, and I think you think, well, I could have been more. There could have been something I could have done, something I wanted. You know, one of the things I've observed is, is kids love their parents. And they're not nearly as interested in the cause or the bad behavior. or the, They may be agitated by it, but they still love their parents. And they understand intuitively that in most, there are some exceptions to this. There are some places where the abuse is so egregious that the kids are better away from the parents. But in the vast majority of the places, they have this intuitive understanding that life would be better if their parents could just love one another and treat one another with integrity and dignity. And if, you, if you're a survivor of that, it's not your fault. And it's, it's also not a curse that has to follow you. You know, the, the best way, the only way I really have any hope for a marriage to work is that the couple understands they've made a covenant in the sight of God and they're gonna do their best to, to lead their lives and their family under that authority, the, the, the biblical perspective, that biblical worldview. And if we'll pursue that, then you get a power beyond yourself to help. You know, I, I think we have the same problem in marriage that we have in politics. We want the perfect candidate. We want a candidate that you know meets all of the criteria or we don't want to participate. And when we think about marriage, it's easy to get disillusioned if we can't find the perfect candidate. Well, there are no perfect candidates. It's, it's, it's a negotiation. And what makes that possible is we agree to the ground rules and that biblical worldview gives us a way to walk that forward. So if you come from a, a broken family, it doesn't mean you're cursed to repeat that. It doesn't mean love is beyond you. It doesn't mean you are not worth loving. It doesn't mean you're doomed to a life of rejection. Um, God is well able to write a story for you. I had a conversation with a woman this week. She came up to me Sunday and thanked me for speaking on behalf of the sanctity of human life. She said she suffered, um, she was the victim of incest. And she said, I gave birth to a daughter who's now an adult and she's the, one of the highlights of my life. And in some of the most egregious abuse, God is able to do something that makes it remarkable. And so no matter how broken someone may think their family situation may have been, God can take that story. The Bible says he's the author and the completer of our story. And he has that license that the author has to write the story until the ending is right. And God will write a good ending for you if you'll cooperate with him. Putting aside only about a minute or so, but putting aside obviously abuse or anything violent, but just the marriage that's just not thriving. What is your advice to that husband and wife? Well, that's not simple. I don't want to oversimplify it, but I think relationships have seasons just like almost everything else. And there are times when they're, they're more fulfilling and more fun. And there are times when they seem difficult and it's a lift. And the best things in our lives are on the other side of difficult. A college degree, a good marriage, uh, good kids. All of those require effort, intentionality, sacrifice, self-discipline. So if you're in one of those seasons that are difficult, first of all, don't give up. Don't go to the default this position that I made a bad choice. And if I'll change partners, something will get better. My experience suggests that if you don't deal with your issues in this relationship, you're going to have to deal with them in the next relationship. So if, if you need professional help, get some professional help. If you're not in the habit of inviting God into the midst of that, on a daily basis. You know, James 1, 5 says, if we lack wisdom, we can ask and God will give it to us. So you can do something as simple as say, God, give me your wisdom. Um, if you feel like all the truth's not on the table, I, I simply begin to say, like God, let the truth be told in this relationship. Let it be made evident. Just start to invite God into the midst of that circumstance and determine that you're gonna honor God. People can't fulfill us. You know, you're not gonna find a relationship that will make you permanently happy and fill you with joy. Uh, those things have to begin within us. A good marriage can enhance those, but a good marriage won't bring those to bear to us. So if you understand that happiness and joy and fulfillment and contentment starts within you, not with your circumstances, 
And then the, the person that's, that you've made this covenant with, ask God for his wisdom. Let the truth be told. And I have found God to be amazingly faithful to bring the things we need to build that better future. Such important truth. Pastor Alan Jackson, World Outreach Church, Alan Jackson. Now, where can people watch your TV show and, and uh, watch your sermons as well, sir? Well, you go to alanjackson.com and get the schedules for all of that. That's probably the simplest way. If you're Central Time, we're on every day at 6 p.m. on TBN. But you go to alanjackson.com. We got a new book coming out called Jesus, His Followers in Politics and a small group study that goes along with it. You can go to the website and get all the information on that as well. We'll do it. Pastor, great to talk to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mike. Keep up the good work.